Hello and test hello everyone. Welcome to class 12 biology. In our previous videos, we have already discussed about some of the processes of recombinant DNA technology. But we have not discussed about the overall processes involved in recombinant DNA technology in a step-by-step -step manner. So we will do that in this particular video. So what are the processes of recombinant DNA technology? So the first process is isolation of the genetic material or DNA from the cells. Right. That is followed by cutting of the DNA at specific locations by use of special enzymes called restriction endonucleases. And then we have amplification of gene of interest using PCR, which is short for polymerase chain reaction. This is important. Right. This is one important topic that we are going to discuss about in this particular video uh, from the examination point of view. Right. And the fourth step is insertion of recombinant DNA into the host cell or the host organism. That is followed by obtaining the foreign gene product from the host cell or the host organism. And finally, we have downstream processing. Right. So we will discuss about all these processes of recombinant DNA technology one by one in this video. The first process is isolation of the genetic material that is DNA. For recombinant DNA technology, we need pure DNA, that is DNA without any other biomolecules associated with it. We know that the DNA, they are located within the cell. Right? If it's a eukaryotic cell, the DNA is located within the nucleus of the cell. In order to get pure DNA out of the cell, we need to break open the cell membrane. And then we also have got some cells which have got cell wall like plant cells, bacterial cells, fungal cells. Right? So we need to break open the cell wall as well. So how do we break open the cell wall and cell membrane and then nuclear membrane? That can be done by uh, using different enzymes which can digest the components of the cell wall and cell membrane. Right. So we have got different enzymes like lysozyme, cellulase, chitinase and lipase. Lysozyme, it can break open the bacterial cell wall. Cellulase, it can break open the plant cell wall and chitinase it can break open the fungal cell wall we all know that the bacterial cell plant cell and fungal cell they have got different chemical compositions within their cell wall so therefore we need to use different enzymes to break open the cell wall and then we treat with lipase enzyme in order to break open the uh, cell membrane so membrane uh, they are made up of lipid bilayer so in order to break down that lipid bilayer we use lipase enzyme after breaking open the cell now we have got uh, DNA, right? but the DNA is not in its pure form because uh, the DNA is associated with structural proteins such as histones. And right? we need to remove those histones in order to get the pure uh, DNA. In order to remove the histones, we treat the mixture with proteases. Right? Proteases are enzymes which can break down the protein molecules. So histone molecules will be digested by proteases. And then inside the nucleus, we also have got RNA molecules, right? tRNA, mRNA, rRNA. So all those RNA molecules can be removed with the help of ribonuclease enzyme. So ribonucleases are the enzymes which can digest RNA molecules, not DNA molecules. And the remaining DNA molecule, the remaining pure DNA molecule can be precipitated out of the mixture, reaction mixture with the help of chilled ethanol. When we add chilled ethanol to the reaction mixture, what will happen? The DNA molecule will precipitate out and it will become visible as a collection of fine threads inside the suspension and that uh, fine thread DNA can be removed by a process called spooling in which we insert a glass, a glass rod and we can pick it up right you can see it over here in your textbook it is given right this is this process is called as spooling and these thread like structures or this mucus like structures they are nothing but the DNA itself it's pure DNA all the other biomolecules like proteins RNA uh, lipids and ev everything they are removed with the help of enzymes right so that is the first step that is isolation of the genetic material from the cell the second process in recombinant dna technology is cutting of dna at specific locations now we already know that this particular process is possible only with the help of one very important enzyme called restriction endonuclease restriction endonucleases are the enzymes which can cut the dna molecule at specific locations called recognition sites right now in this particular process we incubate the purified dna the dna that we have obtained from the first process isolation of dna from the cell right we incubate that dna with restriction endonuclease and it is important that we treat both the dna of interest and the vector dna with the same restriction enzyme in order to get complementary sticky ends 
right so that it becomes easier for us to create the recombinant dna with the help of ligase enzyme right after the restriction endonucleus cuts the dna molecules we separate the dna molecules with the help of gel electrophoresis method right we have already studied about gel electrophoresis method in previous videos and then we mix the two dna molecules that is the plasmid dna and the gene of interest and add ligase enzyme Right. And the ligase enzyme will bind these two molecules and create a recombinant DNA. Right. So that is the second step that is cutting of DNA at specific locations. The third process is amplification of gene of interest using PCR. Right. So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. Right. In this particular process, we amplify or we artificially replicate the DNA or the gene of interest so that its quantities becomes manifold. Right? With the help of this particular process, we increase the amount of our DNA or the gene of interest. So two things are required for us to do that. Right? Those two things are primers. Right? We need two sets of primers. Primers, they are nothing but oligonucleotides, short chain of nucleotides that are complementary to the regions of our DNA of interest. And then we need a very special DNA polymerase called TAC DNA polymerase. So TAC DNA polymerase is special because they can function at a very high temperature. Right? This particular DNA polymerase or the enzyme, they can function at very high temperature. Why? Because we obtain this DNA polymerase from Thermus aquaticus bacteria. Thermus aquaticus bacteria, they live in hot springs. So because of that, their, uh, their enzyme, the DNA polymerase enzyme, they can function optimally at higher temperature. So we need these two things, two sets of primers and DNA polymerase. Right? And we mix the DNA, the DNA or the gene of interest, along with the primers, right, the DNA polymerase, the tag DNA polymerase, and we put deoxyribonucleotides. Right? And we put them in a thermal cycler. So this is a machine. Thermal cycler is a machine in which we can set a sequence of temperatures and we can set the number of cycles that we want to carry on. Right, how many depending upon how many copies of DNA you need. Right. So you can put all these things in a mixture in these small vials and then you can load it inside here and then you can switch on the machine and the machine will do the rest. Right. And we will see what happens within the machine. Right. What are the steps involved during the PCR process? So the PCR process will be carried within the thermal cycler. So in polymerase chain reaction, each cycle of reaction has got three steps. The first one is denaturation, second is annealing, third is extension. So let us look at what happens during each of these steps. So in this particular diagram, we have a double-stranded DNA molecule. So this double-stranded DNA molecule contains our gene of interest and we want to amplify it, we want to increase its number. Right. So in order to do that, we put, that, put this one in the thermal cycler. So in the first step of polymerase chain reaction, that is denaturation, right? The step one is denaturation. We increase the temperature of the thermal cycler to 98 degrees Celsius. At 98 degrees Celsius, the hydrogen bonds present between the two strands of DNA, they get broken down. Right? So the double-stranded DNA molecule gets denatured into two single-stranded DNA molecules. Right? So this is the first step. And in the second step, that is called as annealing. We reduce the temperature of the thermal cycler to 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. At this particular temperature, the primers or the oligonucleotides which had got complementary base pairs on the DNA molecule, they come and bind to their complementary location. Right. So this is why it is called as annealing or binding of the primers to the base pair or of the complementary base pair present on the DNA. And then in the third step, which is called as extension, we increase the temperature again to 72 degrees Celsius in the thermal cycler. At 72 degrees Celsius, the tag DNA polymerase, they function optimally. So the tag DNA polymerase will come and bind over here and starts the polymerization process, right? Thereby creating a new DNA strand on the two old DNA molecule, the two DNA strands, right? Thereby we get now from one DNA molecule, we now get two DNA molecules. Right. In each cycle, we can see over here, one DNA molecules get copied into two DNA molecules. Right. And this particular process or this particular cycle can be repeated again and again within the thermal cycler, right? depending upon how many numbers of DNA molecules you need. 
right so that is what happens during P, uh, pcr right in your textbook this particular diagram is given it's it's it shows the same thing on figure number in figure number 11.6 on page number 202 you can see this particular diagram this shows the three steps involved in pcr cycle right denaturation annealing and extension here the temperatures are not given so you can copy down the temperatures in your textbook and keep it for your reference right now in this diagram you can see that it takes just 30 cycles to increase the dna amount to 1 billion times if you started with one dna molecule after 30 cycles you will have about 1 billion dna molecules how do we get that here's the mathematical expression right uh, I think you can use the formula 2 to the power n, n being the number of cycles. So if you take n as 30, you can clearly see that the number of the DNA copies will be 10 to the power 9, which is 1 billion. Okay, so after just after 30 cycles, we have got uh, 1 billion copies of the DNA molecule. Right? So that is the power of PCR. The power of PCR in increasing the number of DNA which contains our gene of interest. Now we can use these DNA molecules for creating the recombinant DNA. The fourth process is insertion of recombinant DNA into the host cell or host organism. So we can use host organisms such as E. coli bacteria. Right. Now we have already studied that uh, in order for the host organism to readily take up the recombinant DNA we have to make the host cells competent first you all recall that right we have to treat the host cells with divalent cation then we put it on ice and then give it a heat shock and then back on ice so that the host cell can take up the recombinant DNA right so after making the host cell competent to take up the recombinant DNA we have to select the transformed cells we have to identify the transformants from the non transformants so the transformants are the ones which have taken up the recombinant DNA non transformants are the ones which have not taken up the recombinant DNA so we don't need the non transformants we need the transformant ones right so how do we select the transformed cells how do we identify the transformants from the non transformants that we can do with the help of selectable markers such as amphicillin resistant gene for example if the recombinant DNA over here it contains amphicillin resistant genes the E. coli bacteria which has taken up this recombinant DNA will transform into amphicillin resistant bacteria right and if you grow if you put the e coli on a medium containing amphicillin antibiotic only the transformants will grow and the non transformants will die so that is how you identify transformants from the non transformants and that is how you select the transformed cells okay so that is the fourth step that is insertion of recombinant dna into the host cell or the host organism The fifth process is obtaining the foreign gene product. Now remember the main goal of recombinant DNA technology or biotechnology is to get a product that is useful for human beings. Right? A desirable gene is inserted into a host organism so that the host organism can produce a desirable protein for us, a recombinant protein for us. Right? A recombinant protein, if any protein encoding gene is expressed in a heterologous host, it is called as a recombinant protein. By heterologous host we mean a host organism to which the gene does not belong okay for example if we have a bacterial cell producing a human protein like insulin right the bacteria becomes a heterologous host because the human gene does not belong to the bacteria right it has been inserted by the scientists and the protein or the insulin produced by bacteria is called as a recombinant protein so we need such recombinant protein Right. In order to get that recombinant protein, the transformed cells, right, the transformed cells can be grown on a small scale in laboratory or on a large scale in bioreactors, depending upon how much of the recombinant protein you require. If you require the recombinant protein in small quantities, laboratory will do. If you require the recombinant protein in large quantities, then you have to use bioreactors. Right. In laboratory, for example, the cell the the Transformed cell cultures can be maintained in their physiologically most active log or exponential phase right, by providing constant supply of fresh nutrient medium. Right? That will let the cells grow at fast, very fast rate and they are active, they are physiologically active means they will keep on producing the desired protein. 
right and that means we will get a good yield of the desired protein but that is at very small scale right it is it is at less quantities for larger quantities we have to use bioreactors so what are bioreactors bioreactors are defined as large vessels in which raw materials are biologically converted into specific products by using transformed cells kept in optimum growth conditions so you can think of bioreactors as large containers in which we grow these transformed cells just like in laboratory where we grow the cells in a petri dish in bioreactors which are large containers we grow the transformed cells in large quantities we provide them with proper nutrient proper temperature ph oxygen etc so that the transformed cells can produce the desirable protein for us right and the most commonly used bioreactors are of steering type in your textbook two diagrams of uh, steering type bioreactors are given so this is a simple steering type bioreactor and this is a sparge steered tank bioreactor so you should study these two diagrams and practice drawing them right it may be asked in your examination if you study this particular diagram you will see that it has got an agitator system agitator system is the steering system right so the cells which are growing inside this particular large container they are constantly steered or agitated right and there is an oxygen delivery system from here the sterile air is pumped in so that oxygen is properly supplied to the growing transformed cells right and then there is a foam control system on the top we have this uh, blade which controls the uh, foam uh, foam which is formed at the top layer there is a temperature control system as well the temperature is well maintained along with the pressure right? and there is a ph control system in which acid or base is added so that the ph level is maintained okay and then there is a sampling port sampling port means a port from which the samples can be drawn out so that it can be tested right whether the product has been produced by the cell or not so that is the bioreactors and the bioreactors are used for growing the transformed cells to produce large quantities of foreign gene product. So the sixth and the final process of recombinant DNA technology is downstream processing. Right. So what is a downstream processing? Separation and purification of the product which is to be marketed as final product is collectively called as downstream processing. And these processes, separation and purification, they follow the biosynthesis of desired protein. So let's say we have produced a human protein by using E. coli cells in a bioreactor. So the biosynthesis of the desired protein has already happened within the bioreactor. In order, in order for the protein to be sold to the human beings, we need to first separate the human protein and then we have to purify it. Right. And then we have to add preservatives to the product so that the product shelf life increases. And then there are clin clinical trials which the product has to undergo if the product has to be used as medicines or drugs right and then there is always a strict quality control measure for such products right because such products they are they are to be used by human beings if they are used for treating some kind of disease as in medications right they need to be of very good quality they need to be pure right so the downstream processing becomes important in that particular regard right so separation and purification they are collectively called as downstream processing with this we have finished our chapter number 11 biotechnology its principles and processes next we will start chapter number 12 biotechnology and its applications right so before you watch the next video please read section 12.1 and 12.2 which is about applications of biotechnology in agriculture and medicine thank you